I really did pick a really good song. Like, I'm really good. I'm really good at this, guys. <laughs> I'm really good at selecting a free song from Canva to put in the background of a video that introduces people to a stream about GitLab employees. And that's what I put on my resume to get the job. Honestly, they were like, what can you do? I was like, pick really rad 80 sounding music and uh, make videos with it. They were like, oh my, that's impressive. Welcome to Meet the Tanukis. My name is PJ Metz. Uh, this is my Twitch channel, and this is a show all about employees at GitLab. And now, my stream now features at least two Tanukis. We've got this guy up here, right? And we got my brand new fancy hat. I always forget which side I'm on. Yeah. My brand new fancy hat had finally arrived. I've got some good GitLab gear now. Uh, previously, all I had were socks there was like a shirt that i got but uh my wife wears it because you know it was her size they didn't have any big boy sizes uh for those of you who don't know i am a giant uh you probably can't tell because i sit down all the time on this stream i am uh six foot six in american and i am just about two meters tall i just round up to two meters and i'm only bringing this up normally i don't talk about height on this show uh, but my guest today is also a giant, not just in size. And in fact, I think he might actually be taller than me. Uh, we haven't met in person yet, but when we do, we are going to stand back to back, shoulder to shoulder, and someone's going to have a tape measure and it's going to be official. Uh, not only is he tall in the real world, he is a giant of industry in his field. Uh... This is a person who, uh, before I even onboarded at GitLab, when I when I announced that I was going to be working at GitLab, uh, he reached out on Twitter and was like, that's great, I'm so excited for you to see this. And he started like giving me information. And he was like, I probably shouldn't give you too much before you've onboarded, but here you are. And honestly, like I really appreciated it. And then it turned out he was on my team. And then it turned out he became my onboarding buddy. And uh, just one of the the great people that I've met at this company. And I'm just so excited. I talk with him once a week, every week. And he is here today to talk about open source, to talk about uh, his journey into tech, to talk about a whole bunch of things that he has done and created and been a part of. And I'm just so, so excited to have him on the show. Everybody, please welcome Michael Friedrich. Hello. Not, Guten not Tag, tech, Michael. We get. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> we did not plan this. Well, actually, I posted about the hat on Twitter yesterday, and he said, "I'm really excited for the stream." <laughs> yeah, the thing is, you were planning I... this. Yeah, I was when I saw your hat. I was like, "Hey, we should totally do something around that." Um, the, the funny story behind the head is actually I got it for a community contribution back then when I was not with GitLab. Um, oh, no. So when I when I started to become more active in the community, and I also like obviously I wanted to join GitLab at some point. Um, I was pretty much active in the community forum on, on forum.gitlab.com. And I do love to help everyone and engage and reply when the time allows it. And so um, it was Lindsay back then um, who said, well, you are so nice. You're doing so many things. Let's grant you a nice gift. And I was looking at the shop and I was like, hey, the, uh, this, this uh, hat or this cap is so cool. Um, I need to have it. And Can't stop then touching. I have been like, I have been putting it in my background, in my photos, and like you can see, I I, I like to toy with swag and try to put everything <laughs> in the back in the background so you can spot the Easter eggs. And I might be shifting some Lego stuff in the background as well. Yeah, and it's it's uh, <laughs> it's a nice memory from saying I, I love to contribute and I don't expect anything in return, rather than hey, cheers, thanks for for helping me. Um, and then there is a hat, and this is awesome. I love it. Is the hat the first GitLab swag you got? Like, that's the first one? I think so. Yeah. Um, 
the uh, uh, the GitLab team members from uh, GitLab Commit, which was hosted in in London in in 2019. I attended there, and uh, I also provided some feedback on like improving the events. Um, some thoughts around I don't know. I think I wrote a 10 pages long email um, to Priyanka <laughs> and to em to Emily back then. And and it was so nice and also granted me a um, a swag gift with, which I invested into the uh, Rainbow Tanuki T-shirt. So this is not the same as I'm wearing now, mm -hmm. but um, I have no idea. It should be somewhere on my Twitter stream actually, but I'm posting too many photos. Maybe on my Instagram. <laughs> um, but I do love like it's it's cozy it's nice and it it represents what i'm passionate about um i really like the the tanuki and the design of it and and everything around it it's much better than the old tanuki which uh i am desperate to get some merch that has the old tanuki on it i would love it it's for those of you who don't know, uh, GitLab, this yeah, the Tanuki is our mascot and um, our logo as well. But it is this beautifully designed uh, piece of art. But the one before it looked like a very angry raccoon. Um, I might actually see if I can find it because uh, <laughs> it is just terrifying. And even like uh, our, our CEO, Sid, um, said uh, people said it was causing nightmares and so we decided to make it a little more clean oh my god i found it oh perfect okay get ready y'all i think there was like also like a, a challenge or community contributed logo back then if i recall it correctly and like the tanuki is not only nice in a way it presents with orange and brown colors um but you can like change that into a rainbow tanuki which which you already experienced this the icd workshop at mm -hmm. uh, at gnome guadek if i yep. pronounce it correctly yeah um, gnome guadek and and also like um i've seen i think when when KD, kde migrated to gitlab last year um they actually used it with reflection images or pictures from community members hacking on code or something uh, like that cool so this you can play around with the brand as a fan art of course not, not yeah. commercial use uh please read the the brand trademark uh, guidelines right. on, on that there's record. rules about it y'all but but um, using use uh, creating an awesome fan art is, is still allowed, and you might be able to see it in my background. I have a rainbow tanuki, which is made out of watercolors. My best friend got it to, uh, for me, so it's uh, from Nicole Frosch. Um, mm. And I love it. I was I was super excited joining GitLab, and my best friends had like a hard time hearing it every day when we were driving to work to my past <laughs> employer, and. I, th I think I annoyed them at some point, but they they really like understood what I'm passionate about. And and since Nicole started started with uh, drawing nice pictures and then fan art, she got me the the watercolor tanuki. And then I was standing I think for an hour in my room with Zoom um, active, trying to put it in the background as best as possible. Um, so I think. Everything in the background has a story, and the, the, the great thing is it reminds me every day. I try to add new Easter eggs, like there is something from KubeCon in the background sitting on the Millennium Falcon. Oh, I still have the Drache KXCs as well, which remind me of Austria and getting everyone addicted <laughs> to it. Um, <laughs> Drache KXCs are uh, butter cookies with chocolate on it. And the thing uh. is, for the stories, you can only get them in Austria, but not in Germany, where I'm currently living. So I imported them. I was it seems like to my parents and then going back to Germany with a wagon of Drache KXCs. I feel like I would have eaten them already, you know, like I, I wouldn't be able to hold on to that for as long as you have this old Tanuki. I got it to like fan tastic. It looks like the angriest raccoon and I love it. And you're right. Like this one's so much more customizable. There's so much more you can do with the new logo. Um, it's just great. I really, I like the old one, but, uh, but this one is obviously the better design choice clearly. <laughs> yeah, and if we're speaking of like we can do it like a short um 
thing around tanukis which uh let me share my screen as well yeah go um, ahead i just need to find the right window too many tops and too many windows as usual listen that's um, that's the name of the game that's the reason why i have uh, <laughs> a white uh, an ultra white screen where i can have like two windows in the parallel so um pj is currently on the right hand side on the left hand side i do have the amazing work of our design teams um, for creating oh Tanuki gosh. stickers. And this is like, this might be a hidden gem uh, linked somewhere in the handbook. The thing is, I started using, for example, the Cyberpunk Tanuki for uh, project avatars. And this is, um, it's available in here. Um, and Oh my God! And this, this is something you can like, I don't know. I don't know why you can use it. I started using it. Please, please respect the brand guidelines when when using it. Um, but as to provide you an example, um, if I navigate into our developer evangelism um, project space, um, I started using it for the many things to yes. express something like the the workshops have. CI/CD inside, oftentimes, sometimes security and then monitoring as well. And this is a Franconian Tanuki, by the way. Um, Jeffrey created it for um, for the uh, webcast I was hosting, and so I, I I think I copied it from Slack actually, because in Slack <laughs> they also have lots of Tanuki. Stickers. There's tons of Tanukis um, in Slack. And the great thing is, well, um, you can just edit the, the the project settings. For example, if we just navigate in in here and say settings general you can upload your project avatar and yeah. make it look look nice make it more like i'm a i'm a fan of making it look cozy and have a great readme um where you can like i hope this readme is now good oh it's it's actually hey nice. yeah um so we i really like need first... to put pressure to get a a real tanuki emoji and i know we tend to use the fox because it looks really similar i would love to get a real real tanuki um uh emoji yen says it's almost a danish tanuki i love i love danishes the uh we also made like the gitlab cicd go tanuki workshop with the rainbow tanuki um mm -hmm. the fun story behind this is um this is not the original repository um we ha we did have a ci community day last year where uh brandon abubaka and i um, hosted uh, a CI/CD workshop in in uh, three different time zones, actually, so a 24-hour event. And for that, I, we used basically the uh, the CI/CD workshop I had created when starting at GitLab. When John asked me to, hey, can you do something around CI and using the web ID? And I was like, yeah, I have no slides, but let's do it because in the yeah. past I was a GitLab, a GitLab trainer and I had the knowledge of like getting started with um, CI/CD easily. Mm -hmm. And um, I need to find the history actually. Um, oh I, man, we we started working on things <laughs> and. Um, then I did the, uh, then I shared what we have done on, on social. And I think one of the results was basically it, it summons the Tanuki and it was orange and, and brown. I think it took me two days to hack the ASCII <laughs> art into the Golang code. Um, yeah. And, and then there was like uh, Christian Kuhn who, um, created a, a merge request to replace that with a rainbow Tanuki. That's at, pretty great. I think it was 11 p.m. In, in Europe or something. So everyone was sitting on the couch and I was like, hey, Brandon has the next session in like two hours when I'm sleeping. So I will definitely merge that now into the main branch. And, <laughs> and magically his uh, workshop will have the rainbow Tanuki inside. This worked, by the That's way. It was, awesome. really, it was really great. And from there, um, we continue or we, I just copy pasting uh, the source code in every workshop we do um mm -hmm. so we have the the rainbow tanuki in the golden code and basically it's like the um 
it's the first success you run something in in your ci cd pipelines and then you get a nice gift with like the rainbow tanuki um, yeah it was a um this is the first workshop that i ran as well yeah so right inside of the uh of the the logs when you're running these jobs uh it will produce a rainbow tanuki inside of uh the job itself when you're looking inside the pipeline and this was for me the, the when i when i sort of first got to the company it was maybe two months after i'd started and there was a request to um, uh, create uh, a CI CD workshop. And you were like, oh, well, I've done a lot of these. PJ's the new guy. He needs to make sure that he's, he's getting familiar with this stuff. And it's a great learning opportunity for him. And so you were like, you should do it. And so I was like, I said, okay. And then the next day I was like, I don't know Golang. Uh, I kind of understand pipelines but not really and so it was a huge learning experience for me but what made it so simple and what made it so good was that you were there for me and you didn't just say oh pj should do it and then you ran away you said pj should do it and then you worked with me and you let me practice with you and you let me ask you questions good morning jellyman you're up early jellyman's on the east coast just like me of the united states Oh, so it's 9 a.m. for you. Or 9, 9 a.m. is so early. Yeah, I understand that. So my typical working hours are from 10, 10 a.m. to 7, uh, which is covers most of the European and, and the uh, U.S. time zones. Um, yeah, um, I, I tried to build the bridge actually from the CI/CD workshops to how I like got into open source and how I started contributing. Um, yeah, so your your contributions, like you said at the very beginning of the show, you said, I started out contributing, they sent me some swag, I got involved in the community, and then now you work for us. So I, that's exactly the story I want to hear right now. Starting open source, starting as a contributor to GitLab, and then moving into actually employed. Yeah, my story is a little different. Um, how I got addicted into open source, it was not GitLab because it didn't exist in 2009. Um, but yet, I think the the first experience I made with with open source was in a student storm in Vienna in 2005 or 2006. We needed to install Nagios, which is an, an, an which is was an open source uh, monitoring tool um and i think we wanted to monitor our switches or when students came and said the network isn't working we said hey we know it because nagas is red um and we we did get an alert and from there um i like we kept using it and it wasn't perfect and we we didn't really know see or how the the, the language it was it was written in so we kind of accepted that it's it's as good as it's there, but we could look into the source code. And then this got me curious after like after some years digging around. And when I joined the uh, University of Vienna um, for the computer center in 2009, I needed to learn DNS. So I had no idea what this is, but I, I used to know C and, and Perl development a little. Um, and then we had a meeting around we need to update the monitoring project for the university. And I was like, hey, I know Nagios. And so I went myself a new project, um, which led me into learning programming on Linux, um, which I didn't learn because I started hardware software systems engineering, which was heavily Windows based back then. Mm. And it was a learning journey, um, adopting uh, the C++ patterns to C, learning about Fork and Wetpit, no idea what that was. <laughs> I probably still don't understand it. Um, <laughs> it's super hard to explain. Yeah. Um, but in the end, yeah, it was like my first touch with open source. And I figured that Nagios wasn't really active back then. And I saw that it has been forked. So like a fork is you copy the source code, you rename it entirely, and you start a new project in the timeline. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. It's not... It's not the same as like, like you fork something on GitLab or, or GitHub or wherever, um, but instead you continue adding your own features and your own changes and you have two timelines of the projects then. Um, mm -hmm. So 
I don't know, Nagios got some more contributions when the fork was announced after a while, but it wasn't a friendly relationship. It was more or less, yeah, it was sometimes it was rough, um, but this, this <laughs> is history and I'm not talking about it anymore. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the problem is when you have too many negative emotions all around you, you might get depressed or your mental health is at risk. And it, um, I can only recommend to not let the negative emotions into your Twitter stream, into your wherever notifications. I mean, um, it takes work to, 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 to figure out what's good for you and what's not good for you. Because sometimes uh, you're, the kids call it doom scrolling, where you're just endlessly scrolling through twitter and you're like oh like all this is bad things are terrible and like you're just like getting down and especially if that negativity is associated with your hobby or with a thing that you're passionate about doing usually it can be really difficult so i think that's really good advice we 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 got to find ways to to mitigate that uh those bad feelings and, and move past them you know and uh it's a uh a great thought and the problem was i wasn't really strong back then so it was my first open source project i was really passionate about it and and when someone said something bad or like you bad focus or you i don't know um it it touched me emotionally and i was like mm -hmm. ah and to be honest i was quite a not so nice person on the forums back then so like 10 years ago i was i was more or less known for the snarky comments on on the mm. forums rather than for my expertise and for helping everyone <clears throat> um and i figured that this isn't something i want to be called out for or want to be known for and and over time also with moving to to germany in 2012 and getting excited getting excitement for developing something new around monitoring and and also developing my skill set to actually do uh, trainings um when we we started with Asinga 2 back then um we also needed it, it created a new configuration language and so on um and i was i was the developer but i also created the documentation for most of it and the trainings for it um so i was actually starting to yeah, to get real feedback of what to improve of things um, that um, that I used in production, which I didn't know about as developer, because the feedback loop is, is really hard to really understand or impersonate how um, someone who's using your software is actually running into a problem. Um, mm. You can describe it in an issue um, or in a feature request it works in a specific way but sometimes mm -hmm. it's it really needs just like saying hey we're trying this out and then oh actually we could add like this button or we could add a specific other uh, thought around this yeah and, and it, it kept me curious like as a developer i usually got feedback this doesn't work please fix it <laughs> This isn't satisfying. Uh, so at, at some point it is, uh, to be honest, because there is a challenge. You want to learn, you want to debug, you want to hunt, hunt, hunt down the bug. Um, and when you actually find the bug after like 10, 10 days of debugging or something, um, it's like the feeling of success is really strong. Um, the, uh, that's the only that's I mean, just the way you describe like that, that process of like, first off of of a uh, this doesn't work and then that's the normal message and that could be really just draining after a time but if uh, if there's an a community sort of like connection that's much better and that that sort of uh hey this is what we like and this is what's going well and then as a developer when you said oh if we do this well then we can do that and that creativity of being a developer is something that um i think the average person doesn't think about when they think of uh, developing apps or being a web developer or anything like that. Um, uh, Jellyman says, as an illustrator, uh, this isn't good, please fix it, is a relatable statement. <laughs> and uh, Jens said, uh, sounds like something my kids would say, uh, Dad, this sandwich is not good, please fix. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, you, you are seeking for uh, appreciation um when you build something new you share the screenshot you share the like the awesome pull request or merge request you just created and sometimes or somehow you are expecting like a thumbs up or a thank you and if you don't get it you need to like find different ways to keep 
keep motivated. At least this is something I did. So I was doing lots of community support and responding and getting my my positive emotions from that. Um, then again, I jumped onto social media um, and was like, hey, this also works. It's fine. Got addicted. Problem with burnout. Um, and I was doing so many things on the project, which probably others could have done as well. Um, but I was very omnipresent or I was like everywhere, which I realized too late, possibly. Um, but in the end, I was I was really burned out in 2019 of, of monitoring. And um, the good thing around this, basically, you cannot really change history anymore, but it's, it's interesting to reflect on it. Um, from becoming a contributor to an open source maintainer to stepping back to becoming a contributor to GitLab um, was was an interesting experience for me, um, especially because I I have the feeling I don't need to do everything. I can still um, enjoy praise, for example. So when I'm finding some good feedback or even like, hey, this is awesome um, on social media or anywhere else in uh, in uh, online. I'm sharing it in our Slack channels with our product teams, with, with uh, engineering, um, sometimes with uh, Sid in the CEO Slack channel, mm -hmm. um, so that everyone can take can see that. It makes me happy and I'm happy when when our teams are happy or when everyone who's involved is is seeing how how this um, yeah, how, how it works, how people are yeah. excited about it. But I'm also going the route of saying, okay, we appreciate um, this is not so good feedback, but even if it's negative, there is something wise or there is something useful inside because this is your experience and we are trying to help you maybe with within an issue, maybe with responding yes. and ensuring that everyone, yeah. so sounds odd, but ensuring that everyone can contribute um, and it's not just like code. It's it's not just documentation. It's not uh, creating a tutorial. It's also providing valuable feedback and being yes. honest, being honest and respectful in the same moment. Pretty much works with everyone, and and it's a great way of saying okay, it's nice that we designed. For example, what would be a good example? Um, we have CI/CD with stages, um, yes. but in the end. Sometimes people don't want to have stages because it's it's complicated. Um, just define the jobs and then define the um, the direction you want to like link them together with needs, with dependencies. Um, and so from that feedback, um, I think there were two hundred likes or thumbs up, or thumbs up, mm -hmm. thumbs up on that feature which was released in last month's release. And I was like, oh, I never thought about this. And the discussion <laughs> and the feedback in the in that issue was like, yeah, actually, we shouldn't do that, but we can think about the use case. And there were so many great use cases around it. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, okay, um, maybe it's sometimes I'm a strong defender of one one way to do it right. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, because because making a product usable is is like you need to find one way to do it right especially when you begin with it and having a thousand of options and workflows and whatever um this is overwhelming um, mm -hmm. similar to how learning kubernetes was and still is a challenge for me um because i haven't even started oh, kubernetes yet it's it terrifies it's, me a little bit but i will get there eventually i'm gonna do it mark my words y'all yeah, you you need to find a way to like add everything or add the most wanted features to the project to the product, but on the other side, ensure that the learning journey, the documentation, that everything works together, and um, also have everyone like talk about it in yeah. a specific sense. So like someone is presenting, like we had a GitLab commit. Um, in August, uh, there was an awesome talk around CI templates and how to organize it, um, where I'm like peeking into and saying, okay, this could be something for my own workshops or something I, in my storyline where I, I want to help everyone. Um, the other thing I did recently was um, I got back into monitoring um, 
with Prometheus and Cloud Native and then Kubernetes. And, and I was asked to create a Kubernetes monitoring workshop. And I was like, okay, this is, like a, <laughs> this is a lot to ask. But if, if I don't get like the challenge, I will never do it and I will never learn it. And so I, even though I learned in 2002, I learned C++ and VHDL, which is a hardware description language. I'm not using that anymore. Right. But I know, I know how to teach myself um, topics or programming languages or technologies and um, rephrase it in a way that um, I can teach it in, in smaller exercises. Or I can, yeah. I can follow a tutorial and repurpose that into a workshop, for example. Um, that's what that's what's something that's so valuable that you taught me is that uh, you can go and learn something and if you document your learning journey really well, it helps somebody else later learn it. You could turn it into a tutorial, you can turn it into a workshop. And because you're documenting it so well, it actually helps you keep that learning and reinforce it for yourself. Um, you're not the only person who has told me this before that the idea of like documenting your learning in order to use it for someone else. That's how I uh, learned to code was um, doing it live in front of people and saying, I'm starting to learn C sharp or I'm starting to learn Node.js. And if you watch this video, you're gonna learn with me too. And it helps me remember how to learn and it helps me um, uh, it helps me, what's the word, uh, keep that learning and it helps me spread that learning. So it's, it's really awesome that, uh, that advice that you gave me. And you do this constantly with like new languages all the time. Like you're learning Rust right now, right? Yeah, I'm, t I'm tr actually trying to learn Rust and I, I still have the books on my desk because I decided not to read them in my, uh, PTO or vacation. So I kind of. <laughs> Hopefully, can read it and hands on Rust. The thing is, um, normally I I would be reading it online, but I'm reading too much, many things online, so I'm trying to take a step back and read a book actually. And this uh, has uh, effective learning through 2D game development and play, so it has a gamification factor. And nice. one of my personal things I never learned is game development. I would love to learn how a game engine works, but the C code is. <laughs> It's, it's overwhelming um, and I'm not really a fan of it because it I can understand it, but I cannot teach it or I cannot like practice that with others. And I'm hoping to ad adopt some 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 patterns or some some ideas of creating some mini games and, and repurpose it in a workshop because a workshop like I'm happy when when I can do it. I'm currently working on a pipeline efficiency workshop for like in two and a half weeks. I have not started yet, um, but I have so many ideas in my head. Um, and this makes me happy when I can create content where others can benefit from. Sounds odd, but it's so sort of my my real feedback line, my real like, this is what I want to do. And I'm, I'm super happy that my path went that way of saying, hey, um, we were approached, I think, in 2016. Uh, you Developers should also, or the, the dev, dev department needs to earn money. Okay, then let's do trainings, Git trainings. And Git is like, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> and I think I gave 10 to 15 GitLab trainings, some in-house at customers, some like uh, in Nuremberg. And, and I got so much feedback from the trainings where we tried things out live and there was basically the low level of shame we do at GitLab as well. Yes. Um, we tried things out. We improved uh, the training. We open sourced it. Um, we merged um, GitLab into the training. So adding CI CD, adding GitLab as a server in, I think, 2018. And, and from there, I was like, OK, GitLab, we use GitLab. We are not using everything in GitLab because we were focusing on the, on the community edition or the free edition in that, in that regard. And then someone asked, well, what can we do with the enterprise edition? And uh, I was like, uh, hmm, I need to like <laughs> read the documentation now, which was kind of embarrassing for a trainer. But mm -hmm. OK, um, in, in the meantime, I was Googling while talking. Um, and 
yeah, and I said, okay, these are like the epics. You can group issues, you can use advanced security features, and so on. Um, and I figured that I I cannot know everything. Um, and when joining GitLab, um, I didn't know about all the all the great features we develop or we we offer. And it's a it's a steady learning curve. And oftentimes it's a Slack thread or an issue where I'm tagged in um, building relationships with our product and engineering teams and getting pinged and tagged also from community questions on the forum um, mm -hmm. to or on social um, to to see well I think I tried to help a user with some Kubernetes executor configuration um, on the forums recently mm -hmm. I still need, I still need to res reply to the to the last answer um, but it got me reading the source code of the runner um and reading the documentation um trying to help um achieve the understanding uh from mm -hmm. the user and i'm thinking about uh creating a merge request for our documentation um to have or, or encourage the user to create it actually um yes because <laughs> i think every question which which is asked and is not answered by the documentation needs a fix in the documentation or an update for the documentation um, because the documentation should be the single source of truth and it should be extensive. Um, it cannot replace a tutorial step right. by step um, or a video. Um, but for that, we have our blog. We have GitLab Unfiltered on YouTube where we can upload any walkthrough, anything which is which we do. Um, yeah. Which I think is totally awesome because before joining GitLab, I was watching... Uh, the, the group conversations um, and and some some other meetings. I think I watched Sid discussing uh, monitoring and observability topics, and I felt as I was be, was be sitting in the group now and yeah. <laughs> commenting on on it. And and this was like this is a unique feeling. This is something um, I can be part of the conversation, but it doesn't matter where I'm at and. Being inspired GitLab from... is unique in that, like, like it is a very open uh, company, and a lot of things is uh, it's it's public by default, and that sort of transparency is uh, not common. Like, you can go onto the GitLab YouTube page, the unfiltered YouTube page, because we have two YouTube pages. We have GitLab, the brand and GitLab Unfiltered, and you can watch meetings that are uploaded there. Uh, you can actually watch this stream uh, gets uploaded to GitLab Unfiltered after we after we run these uh, uh, episodes. And um, it's just so strange that like, like you said, as a contributor, as a person who was on not, a, not an official team member yet, you were still able to participate in these meetings and hang out and be a part of that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, listen, you don't work for us, but if you want to come be a part of our meetings, you can. <laughs> Thank you, Brendan. <laughs> yeah, the, I think the, 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 the great thing about this is um, you might be chatting in the YouTube comments in the live stream. I think this is, I, I'm not sure if, if we actually read that, um, but you can comment on Twitter. Um, you can reach out on the community channel and say, hey, I've watched this uh, conversation or this meeting uh, from the package group, for example, and I have this idea about a feature request. I think I watched, I think the, the was it the NPM registry or I had ideas around um, RPM packaging and Debian packaging because I learned that myself as a developer and it was a, a rough learning curve to actually understand yep. it. Um, I, I have been like given talks around this topic as well, like my learning journey as developer, um, at DockerCon, for example, the thing is, um, get inspired because, um, oftentimes yeah. it's, it's just this little thing and it's not on social media, which is running too fast and it's not somewhere in your emails, which I don't read to be honest, um, because <laughs> get, get, get don't laugh. GitLab made me um, appreciate async work. And if you want something from me, which needs my immediate attention, you provide as much context as possible. So don't 
don't ask me for a call, provide me a link to the documentation or the issue and um, define the specific ask. And then we can go along efficiently. Um, and like email is yeah, um, a long thread and there might be information being lost and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm using that sometimes for doing things. Um, but in the end, it's easier when, for example, uh, preparing for a podcast or stream or anything else, open up a Google Doc and collaborate in there or yeah. maybe even jump in a GitLab issue and, and do it from there. And I will say that like the, this GitLab does not do a lot of emails and most of my emails are just notifications that there's something going on in an issue. And so I just... It's like, hey, you know, so and so tagged you in this issue, so I just click in and I go do the work in the issue, and yeah, once you go, once you go async, you can't go back. Uh, email becomes a chore, and who likes chores? It's it's stunning how few emails are are used at GitLab for anything other than just like an alert. The work happens in issues. Um, the collaboration happens in Google Docs and issues. And it's just fantastic that, uh, you know, like I don't have to worry about checking my email. I just go to my issues and I'm like, hey, like what is what's what am I assigned? What am I tagged in? And that's my workflow. It's fantastic. Yeah, and I think um, I was just looking up some um, some ideas from my continu continuous learning journey as well as like how I started contributing to GitLab. And one <laughs> thing I wanted to point out is um, I, I joined GitLab, but I'm not a Ruby on Rails developer and I'm not a Vue.js developer. I'm actually like front end is love and hate relationship for me. Um, <laughs> where I'm, I'm sourcing from, from Brandon's knowledge and from your knowledge. And I'm, I've also been watching uh, Cassidy Williams from uh, Net, Netlify, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and learning from occasions. Um, but in the end, <clears throat> I, for example, understand um, the doc, understand. I know how the <laughs> documentation, I know certain documentation parts and I started contributing the knowledge I was building up with the CI monitoring webcast, which was later repurposed into a CI pipeline efficiency documentation and is yeah it, it lives on and it's like a mix of documentation and knowledge sharing um it's writing uh blog posts around specific mm -hmm. topics like docker hub monitoring was was really nice last year this year i jumped into uh jq and then json parsing and made a too long blog post um we also had gitpod and i told you about gitpod um that's right Git, gitpod is so cool you guys it is so cool Oh my God! And it is it is a full VS Code <laughs> instance in your browser. You can get to. You, all you have to do is. Uh, I'm, we're gonna we're gonna show it. We're gonna show GitPod. It is <laughs> absolutely. Amazing. I'm gonna do it on my personal um, because uh, it's just so good. Let me dump that over there. Let me share my screen again. It is. I actually uh, used it. Um, let's see. Projects dashboard. That should be the one. Uh, when I was doing some, uh, just some basic stuff on Twitch when I was hanging out, showing people stuff. So, uh, this is my, uh, Twitter divas. These are all my Twitter bots that I have. Uh, Shania Twain, Badiana Grande, all this stuff. This is what I've been doing with Chloe Condon. But right here, normally you can open up web IDE right in your browser. Gitpod launches a VS Code. It's literally VS Code in your browser and it's unreal and michael i, I can't addicted. <laughs> i'm absolutely addicted it's so good i'd rather do this than work locally for sure while and that's preparing thing? tell us go ahead and tell us more about anything we'll let that run <laughs> um the the great thing about gitpod was we I think we saw the announcement last year in October, November. And I was like, okay, this got us curious because there was like code spaces and then and other web IDEs around. Um, and we we were looking for learning Rust or learning a new language, um, which which means okay, we 
I think back then we were using Cloud9 or something else for pair programming. This was a, was acquired by AWS. Um, and like, I don't want to install a dev environment locally because I need to learn Docker, maybe have it in a Docker environment, in Vagrant. It helped me uh, greatly in the past 10 years in my learning journey and to make it approachable for new contributors. Um, but in the end, it's like, if it doesn't work in Docker containers because it needs kernel modules or Linux environments, um, have it run somewhere else in the cloud. But yeah, we can provision something with Terraform from my Ansible in AWS or um, in GCP or whatever, but it's still, it's complicated and it needs resources, which you need to pay for if there is no free tier. And, and if someone really creates a workspace for you where uh, the Rust compiler is pre-installed where Cargo, the, the package manager of Rust, is pre-installed or where, where you can even run, up, install, build essential um, for installing the C++ compilers in Debian. Um, you can prepare something and you don't need to explain it to anyone who wants to start contributing or wants mm -hmm. to, like, if you're moving around somewhere all over the world and you don't have, like, the... Um, you don't have your MacBook with you, but you want to do it on an iPad or on your tablet. You can actually do that in your browser, um, which is mind blowing, I think. And Spun. making it making it approachable um, of having this ready to use uh, with the editor and also the terminal. And I'm a fan of the terminal with um, adding git CLI commands or just mm -hmm. testing things out. I'm an old admin ops person, to be honest. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still faster than any uh, Visual Studio Code uh, shortcuts, but I need to learn. <laughs> um, the, the real great thing about this is it feels like your local settings or you can like apply your local mm -hmm. settings um, into your Git port environment. And there is a free tier with 50 hours per month, which is great um, mm -hmm. just for like you want to learn a new language, you want to do it together in a live stream, or you want to just, um, for example, use GitLab in Gitpod. Um, so the GitLab development kit in, in Gitpod. Um, because if you install GitLab locally with the many features and um, dependencies, you might be running into the problem that the Ruby version is not up to date or Node.js takes too long to install. And um, it's also like, it's in your system um, and having the, this isolated in, in the workspace is, is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was fully dying about that. Like it, it felt so good to just be able to do it all right in the browser tab to have uh, access to extensions. Like you said, you create a working environment exactly the way you want it to be within there. It's so, it's so good. It's so good. Oh, it makes me so happy. Yeah, and the thing is, um, or the the really great thing is, it's not like you're, you're configuring so much in JSON or somewhere else. Um, you can extend um, the, the the workspace image building. You can create your own Docker files um, and your own Docker images. And I think for GitLab uh, for GitLab the project, we're using a pre-created Ruby based image, um, which has certain dependencies installed already. Um, and I think Gitpod also announced pre-builds, which allows you to have sort of a cached layer of the workspace image built, and you don't need to install everything all the time. This is a similar pattern with CI CD where you install everything all the time in, in a fresh mm -hmm. Docker environment and your CI CD is slow and you your merge requests are blocked because CI is slow and so on. <laughs> different different topic of mine. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, in the end, you want to have a fast um, and, and reliable development environment um, in your browser. Um, potentially. You can still like when you you can install the GitLab workflow extension. You can see CI CD running merge requests and so on. Um, mm -hmm. If you decide that you want to go locally again, um, you can always do that because it's just a Git clone away um, or an integration away. Um, mm -hmm. 
switch between browsers, share the, the URL with someone because the, mm -hmm. the port is running in the cloud. So you get an accessible URL for the web server, for example, or the ports exposed. Um, they are private by default since most recently, yes. but you can um, you can also up, uh, configure them publicly available or make them available, share it with your team members, share it with your manager, someone you want to convince for. Um, the problem is the port <laughs> needs to be running, of course. But yet, yeah, I think the future is bright in that regard. And Absolutely, it is. When we can tie it into um, the DevOps platform workflow, um, which where we say, okay, we have Dev and we want to develop something, but we also want to have automated CI with unit testing, with running uh, production tests or staging environment tests then coming later to service level objectives, quality gates, monitoring, performance insights, perf application performance monitoring, to get an oh, idea as developer why the application is not fast enough because this one git commit in the algorithm changed the loop and it's mm -hmm. 10 times slower. And um, typically in my learning journey, the customer was opening an issue which is super urgent or was super mm -hmm. urgent. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, you're, you're letting everything else go and you need to fix that bug. And 14 days later, you are burned out and you fix the problem, maybe, um, because you cannot reproduce it in your local environment. If you shift that left basically from the customer into your CI CD pipelines with a reproducible mm -hmm. environment, um, I'm hoping, and we're not yet there um, in, in its full, um, but I'm hoping that developers also see. Um, the easy way of using, for example, CI CD tracing, getting an understanding why an HTTP request is slow, or um, the database backend is actually the reason why the requests are slow. Um, getting these insights is oftentimes really hard and you don't know where to start. Um, but w we're improving the tools. We have um, technology like Open Telemetry, um, we have Prometheus, we have mm -hmm. everything in Kubernetes deployments, making it easy de to to deploy the, uh, the applications. Mm -hmm. And from from there, um, yeah, it's um, getting feedback. Why something doesn't work is easier uh, rather yeah. than saying, hey, I need to install Red Hat 5 in VirtualBox <laughs> and I have no idea how to do that and how to expose uh, the ports from yeah. VirtualBox to the host system. Um, moving on to, hey, a Vagrant box, yeah, it's amazing. Hey, Docker, yeah, it's also amazing. Um, but I just want to have the real system others are, or my team is using um, available as well. And I don't want to reinvent the wheel because my environment needs to run on Windows yeah. for some reason. Um, so, well, many, th many things learned. There's a lot. I mean, listen, there's, there's so much that like a, a lot of this work and a lot of what you do is about trying new things and showing people the new things you're trying. And all of that is in search of finding solutions that work for people, which is just awesome. Um, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to drop this, I think. Yeah, just yeah, a, any, quick, a, yeah. a quick share for one minute. Um, I did a talk at DockerCon and also at... Um, AWS uh, OS TechConf lately. Um, the uh, the video is linked in the uh, description down below over here in the stream. Mm -hmm. um, this is my learning journey from source code to learning containers um, to maintaining uh, things, understanding ops. Um, and I think I talked one hour about it, but I could talk endlessly about it. Um, <laughs> it provides it provides you with ideas and some uh, thoughts I had shared now. Um, mm -hmm. And this is like, see the value in metrics and logs I just said. Um, we really need to, like, we are not devs anymore at a certain point. We really need to see the value ops and, and sec and everything around it provides us to get better as developers. Uh, yeah, This is something I'm seeing. The other thing is, um, yeah, automate things because yeah. uh, manual. Ma there are some people who say manual work is a bug, and I, mm. 
I I try to live by that spirit. Um, so if there is like a CI/CD schedule or anything which runs in a cron shop, I totally put it there because or create a bot like you are creating bots. Um, <laughs> yeah. For, what is the what is the uh, Twitter thing you're doing? The, the... Oh, it's just trying to get Mountain Dew to sponsor me. <laughs> yeah, this this one basically. So everything which can be automated um, is great. When you automate it, document it so that others can find what you did and why mm -hmm. something is doing some magic stuff uh, basically in there. Um, yeah. And this brings me basically to the conclusion for today. Um, I love that we have a public handbook at GitLab where I can document not only my workflows, but the tools and tips section has how to resize an image on the CLI, how to uh, apply Google mail filters, how to do basically everything, which I normally added to my own private blogs. I can now use a single source of truth and this is amazing. Right. So that's the link to the handbook. This is the link to the presentation he was talking about. We've got to sign off because in two minutes, I'm coming back. <laughs> and it's going to be me and another amazing Team Lab, uh, GitLab team member. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, and listen, y'all, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate everyone in the comments. Stick around. I'm going to sign off and sign back on. And we're going to be talking to Christos Bacaracas. And you guys are going to love it. Thanks for coming, y'all. Enjoy. Thanks. And see you online. <laughs>